everyone! Welcome to another wrestling pay-per-view review from the CC Network. I'm Freddie Thomas, your ever-reliable host as always, and it's time to analyse the first post-SummerSlam Raw-branded pay-per-view, No Mercy 2017, which emanated from the Staples Center in Los Angeles, California. Now, there was only one match on the kickoff show this time, thank God, as we saw Apollo Crews lose to Elias. Scintillating stuff. There's a lot to get through here, so let's crack on with the main card. We start off with The Miz defeating Jason Jordan to retain the Intercontinental Championship off a skull crushing finale resulting from a Curtis Axel interference in 10 minutes and 13 seconds. Now here's a surprise I don't think many expected. We got a Jason Jordan match that wasn't boring. Now some of you will state that Cena and Reigns had their matches with him the last few weeks and they were not boring. In fact, they were great, but there wasn't much at stake for the challenger, so it was a very one-sided affair, meaning outside of fighting with Reigns and Cena, there wasn't much for him to gain from it. This, however, was a platform for showcasing Jordan as a good wrestler and the real deal for the future, and well, that was pulled off well as Miz played Ragdoll for most of these 10 minutes, making Jordan look fantastic, putting him over as much as possible, while the commentators argued over his experience, integrity, and tenacity. It was building up quite well and had a consistent pace too, going on a little too long while also giving me just enough story without body psychology to make it worth the time, all while a pro Miz crowd chewed and spat out his challenger, creating heat while appreciating his skill. The dirty finish was foreshadowable and understandable, but the match was still decent. It was not average, but solid enough for me to award two stars. Now, I expected this match to bomb, but instead what we got was a match that did its job and ensured that Jordan, despite a negative reaction, highlighted why people wanted him in a better position in the first place. His mic skills may need some work still, but his in-ring skills are great on their own. All he needs to do is work on some body psychology in a feud that matters, and we could be looking at someone great for the next few years to come. This was a good test for the challenger, who looked good even in defeat, something that didn't happen to Baron Corbin at SummerSlam, and shows how this kind of undercard match is done correctly. Following that up, we have the man-to-man -man matchup. Yeah, because we needed to explain that these two are both human. I don't understand how that works, as we had Finn Balor defeating Bray Wyatt off the coup de grace in 11 minutes and 32 seconds. And yes, it's the coup de grace, not the coup de grace. Corey Graves, I love you, but even you make mistakes, and that one is slightly irritating. Now, this match was a rematch that did not have as much venom as its predecessor at SummerSlam did. Now, surely that means the demon is mightier than the man on that definition alone, because it sure as hell sounds like it, as Bray's dominance in a contest he looked sure to have won was crushed despite a decent story being built into the process as Finn fought back from the pre-bell assault. The small amount of selling, counterbalancing with the continuous work on the injured ribs by Bray and almost everything he did was good to balance, while the crowd were into Finn enough to be able to make it exciting as the pace was drawn out and methodical with a late flurry that felt so artificial that it hurt as this match went on just long enough but honestly, longer than expected with too much momentum shifting to feel balanced at all, despite a one-sided first half. The match, however, was still somewhat entertaining, but lackluster in places to where it just doesn't hit the heights that it could have done with more build to it, and it gets a one and a half star rating, but I know it could have been much better with a lot more at stake. It lost the intensity the SummerSlam bout had, and having Finn be the same wrestler that he is in the Demon Persona, something I noted back at SummerSlam, did not help matters here. Even with the different storytelling device to give this match something to work with, it still felt quite barren and flat, so it didn't hit all the right buttons for me and get to the rating that I feel it roundly deserves. These guys should have done a lot better, and again, they should have been supplied with much better materials to work with. Next up, we have Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins defeating The Bar to retain the Raw Tag Team Championships off the Dirty Deeds in 15 minutes and 55 seconds. Now, all I can say about this one is damn, we need to get to the elephant in the room, and that's obviously that not only did Cesaro lose this match, he also lost his two front teeth hitting the LED post. My god, every time I look at a picture of that, it makes my teeth Hurt. It makes my whole body hurt. It makes my blood crawl. And it added even more physicality to a match than a feud that when push came to shove showcased why these two teams are not to be messed with. And alongside the fact that thanks to the amazing selling, it looked like Ambrose separated his shoulder from the minute he went into the steps. 
it was ridiculous. This match, it went from the brutal destruction of the lunatic fringe's arm to an all-out panel struggle as both teams attempted to hit that killer blow and just couldn't get it done with some damn fine near falls, including that white noise top rope sit out powerbomb combo, which honestly should have been the finish, but I'm really happy it wasn't because the crowd went nuts. And I'm sure the crowd were apprehensive at first when the match started getting going though. They went all over the place, they loved it, and it was just great because they knew solid tag team wrestling was about. And you can't go wrong with that. The match went just the right amount of time, but its pace was a little disjointed. There weren't enough momentum shifts as it felt slightly more one-sided than it should have. And there wasn't enough body selling and working of body parts outside of Ambrose's already noted shoulder to keep that going. Regardless though, the match was fun and did enough to grab your attention, even if one person had to grab your attention graphically and very accidentally indeed. Now this didn't have the intensity of the SummerSlam match, which honestly I think was better, but it was still a fine three-star effort by two of the best teams in WWE right now, proving that no matter which brand you're on, and how thin both of those rosters are in terms of tag teams, they are more than capable of creating great matches, and this, again, was one of them. Next, we saw Alexa Bliss retain the Raw Women's Championship, defeating Nia Jax, Sasha Banks, Emma, and pinning Bayley outright off a of Spike DDT in the fatal five-way match after nine minutes and 40 seconds. We arrive now at my favorite match of the night, if you can believe it, a match that I wasn't expecting to have enjoyed as much as I did, but this quick bout was not only as frantic as I wanted it to be, but it had the physicality to match as well. The crowd could not get over how insane the two Nia Jax spots were and how bored to the wall the near falls were, as the storyline dissensions of friendship along the way made it even more spicier, as it showed just how much this match meant to all five competitors. Something that SmackDown's five-way elimination match at Battleground was incredibly bereft of, because seriously, you want to see how much a title means to people? This is how you do it. Now on top of that, it was great to see all five women, even Emma, look good in places to show how varied and skilled they all are. This was exciting and rough around the edges, and all I can say is it's more deserving of its three-star rating than it honestly looked like it did. It did a lot in near 10 minutes, and I will reward it accordingly. While the move variety category may be overinflated to some degree, may I remind you it's very rare to see a double Samoan drop and a four-person apron to floor powerbomb in two different matches, let alone the same one, so its scoring for me is validated quite resolutely. Now, the match made Jax solidify Bliss for a showdown with the incoming Asuka, who is arriving at TLC, and it assured that Banks, Bailey, and Emma looked good so the fans could make sure their matches are worth watching in the future. This may not have been an out-and-out -out great match, but everyone won in this one despite only the title being carried out by one shoulder. All in all, I enjoyed this one. It was missing some fundamental parts to take it into that great territory, but for a women's match where mostly on pay-per-view the last year they've been kind of bad, I'm happy to see a three-star one for only I think the second time this year. That is a good thing to see. Now, it's time to get on to one of the two WrestleMania-worthy main events, as we saw Roman Reigns defeat John Cena off a spear after he kicked out of four AAs. Good Lord. In 22 minutes and five seconds. Now, many people will say this is as hard-hitting, physical, and crazy a match as you would expect from the top two guys in the company. For me... I was very roundly disappointed, considering these two were spitting fire legitimately for weeks. You'd expect this bout to have intensity to match that. But sadly, what we got was a hot crowd being entertained by a long and drawn out spot fest full of near falls. The psychology was minimal, the match went as long as expected, and had a table spot that thanks to Roman Reigns landing right on his neck, looked really nasty. This was just about all I could muster from this epically anticlimactic match, as it seemed to never get out of first gear, until it clicked to go all the way down to sixth, with so many near falls and finisher kickouts that even my patience wore thin with it. Now, to have a wrestler kick out of four AAs, when it only took one Dirty Deeds, one Spike DDT, and one F5 to secure victories for Ambrose, Bliss, and Lesnar respectfully is a joke, to where suspension of disbelief isn't only thrown out the window, but thrown through a wood chipper in the process. Now sure, Reigns did win with one spear, 
which is great if you forget that he ended up having it being kicked out of earlier in the evening as well as being kicked out so many times in the past to where it didn't have the venom that he used to. Also, I'm not angry that Reigns won because I saw it from a mile out, but it's just the way that he won it. It just rubs me the wrong way and it basically takes all the storytelling and throws it in the garbage until you highlight that Cena is used to getting out of this situation and the fact he got bested means it kind of works, along with the fact that Reigns kept taunting Cena all the way through this one-sided fight. All I can say is that this match rubbed me the wrong way and it wasn't the most entertaining thing I've ever seen. And it would have been near zero territory had it not been for the white hot crowd that created that partisan, yet funny, yet crazy intimidating Coliseum atmosphere that I expected them to do so, being as loud as hell with charts aplenty for pretty much all of it, even at its most mundane moments, despite a few drops and a bit of irritation in places. As a result, thanks to Los Angeles, this match gets a one and a half star rating that I don't feel it deserves, but even after that train wreck that I saw, it's a miracle it even got that far. Now, was this match WrestleMania worthy? The build-up certainly felt like it, but I just wish the match was able to be on par with it, and sadly, all we got was good atmosphere and minimal positives among a sea of pessimism and irritancy. Let's just hope that this night doesn't get any worse, but I think you all know, if you've seen this show, what the rebuttal to that statement is. And following on from that massive, massive disappointment, we get to the biggest one of the evening. You know what it is. It's the Cruiserweight Championship match, which saw Enzo Amore defeat Neville off a low blow of all things to become the new champion after 10 minutes and 40 seconds of what could be called as action if you added some weird extra additives and supplements to it, because it wasn't even close to that. Not just that, am I irritants? My correct streak of predictions on this show ended with this match. I've never been more irritated to lose a prediction game than I have with this one. The fact is this match was as dull as dishwater, and that's an insult to dishwater. It was slow, empty, lethargic, and it made me question, with my suspension of disbelief going out the window completely, how Enzo could possibly fight back after being kicked to pieces by a better wrestler is honestly beyond me. And to win it with a low blow? is fundamentally infuriating and quite insulting, because all he hit was a top rope DDG and that. That is all he did. And he won the championship against a guy who has been kicking the crap out of a division for nigh on close to a year. I don't understand this, and it's utterly bemusing. This match had so little substance that I spent most of its time looking at a picture of a puppy in a box on Twitter, because that was a damn sight more entertaining than this snooze fest was, and it gets a stone cold zero. And if not for the amount of Rusev squashes we've seen on pay-per-view this year, this would have definitely been a contender for the worst pay-per-view match of 2017. And on top of that, Enzo, you're trying to do the lie, cheat, steal mantra that Eddie Guerrero had? I mean, you stole the championship, you cheated to win said belt, and you also lied to Neville's face. Because you called him ugly? Have you looked in the mirror lately, sir? Because you look like you've been on a never-ending coke binge since you arrived in the company. The fact is, you're not as endearing as Eddie to be able to pull off dirty stuff and have it come back to good vibes. If you're trying to make him a dickhole heel who's hated by even the fans for what he did backstage, WWE, you're doing the right thing because I already hate his guts. But if you're keeping him a babyface, with all this going on, you're making one huge mistake. And what I'm going to say is, this match was garbage. And let's move on to the main event, which... Had us see the unthinkable as Brock Lesnar defeated Braun Strowman, I cannot believe I've said this, off of 1F5 to retain the Universal Championship in exactly 9 minutes. And honestly, where the hell do I start with this? Firstly, the result was the wrong one. In my honest opinion, the momentum was going in Strowman's favour, he needed to win. Simple as. I think a lot of people on the internet, even the hardest of wrestling critics to please, would have been noting of that. Secondly, a slow and long Lesnar match is something that does not work, and it proved it. And finally, finally, a match that excited many in the build-up sent this crowd to sit on their hands in silence. How could this have happened? 
Well, based on what I've just said, it's easy to see why. Because the momentum of a monster was stopped in its tracks, they somehow made a Lesnar match very boring, despite usually being the most intense match on the card, and it disappointed a crowd seeking change by rewarding petulance and greed with a championship that Lesnar himself barely deserves, all because WWE wants to have Roman Reigns dethrone Lesnar's long reign by unseating him at WrestleMania. <laughs> at the expense of all of our patience while we're at it. Now, while this match did have moments of psychology and Strowman's early dominance and Lesnar's resilience and the crowd and length and my enjoyment adding to minimal aspect to get it away from the edge of the precipice, this was one of the most anticipated matches of the year and it walked away with a bloody nose and a sea of angry patrons, including myself. Because how the blue hell could they just get this so wrong? I honestly don't know. Even though I've summed up exactly what the problem is, it makes my mind explode that they even managed to mess this up. WrestleMania worthy? Once again, like Cena versus Reigns, in the build-up most definitely, in the match itself, you gotta be kidding me. It's a one-star match that did not justify the hype, as far as I'm concerned, with a very boring and mundane contest despite some good moments, briefly, that just made this pay-per-view end on a very disappointing and anticlimactic note. And as a result, it is now time for me to look back at my final thoughts on this pay-per-view. To start this off, I have to ask WWE a couple of very firm questions. One, how can two of the most anticipated and hyped matches of the year get overwhelmed by an undercard that no one gave a shit about going in? Simple. And second of all, not just that, how did you manage to send your audience home bitterly disappointed after delivering solidly up until the last three matches? I know indecisive booking was the answer to both of those questions, and it sums up just how disappointed I am in your writing team, because all that hype and the loss of Cesaro's front teeth were for nothing. Because in the end, instead of offering up a sleeper hit contender for pay-per-view of the year, this ranks up as a contender for one of the worst, even though I know because of Battleground it will not come close to winning it. It still doesn't feel any less painful though, regardless of that notion. What I've already noted is important. The undercard surprised with solid matches that got better in quality as they went on, including two good multi-person matches that got the night set, as it was building to that massive payoff apart from the Cruiserweight match, obviously, only to be let down by the quality and results of what came after them. At the end of this night, it'll live in infamy as the night Roman defied logic, Enzo was a disgrace to an already corpse-like championship, and Strowman's momentum was stunted with an unclear future ahead. It may not have been the bottom of the barrel terrible like Battleground was, but I came out of this decent card feeling as annoyed as I was on that evening. At least Battleground was rubbish, mostly from top to bottom, therefore it had no other place to go but down. <laughs> Which frustrates me even more, is just how far this pay-per-view fell from expectations. Sure, last year's No Mercy only got a 4 out of 10, but even that was better, because you had two 4-star matches plus on that card. A few solid to good matches on this one does not mask over the top-heavy irritants that the final three matches caused, making me believe that I can offer, well, no mercy in scoring this card rather harshly, as it achieved nowhere near my expectations that it was charted for. Overall, No Mercy 2017 gets a disappointing score of 3.5 out of 10. So as a result, the first post-SummerSlam Raw branded pay-per-view kicks WWE's Autumn to the dogs before it even had a chance to get on its feet running at a leaf-prone ground. Now what worries me is that SmackDown's Hell in a Cell is just two weeks away and it might struggle to escape similar territory. But at least I know the Owens and Shane Hell in a Cell match will be a bloody bloodbath if it isn't. Well, that show could end up exactly like this one in disappointing in so many ways. Now, let's hope that within the next month's offerings, including TLC, we will get something good. But Lord knows, Lord knows at this point, because this pay-per-view does not give me much hope for the future. But WWE, they've rebounded from worse. So anything is indeed possible, or at least I think. So let's hope I'm proven right with that statement. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. The No Mercy 2017 review is done. I hope you've all enjoyed this review, hopefully more so than the show itself, because they had a 
good thing going with that pay-per-view up until those last three matches, where, to paraphrase Frank Sinatra, WWE went and spoiled it all by doing something stupid, like making those matches be so bad and disappointing that the whole entire quality of the card tanked with it. We were looking at an average show up until those matches, and I'm feeling pretty bad as a result. Good lord. Then again, ladies and gentlemen, what do you all think about this show? Do you think that my opinions are justified? Or do you feel that I've smoked just as much crack as Enzo probably has over the last few years? Just look at the state of him. All you have to do is put your comments down there in the comment section below, and I look forward to responding and reading them. And of course, I do want to point something out that due to Equestria Girls Month next month, Hell in a Cell and TLC, along with the Friday Flashback, will not be be up. So if you want to keep an eye on what is happening with my views on Hell in a Cell and TLC, go to the CC Network Twitter account at CC Network YT down in the description box and you'll be able to see my play-by-play -play commentaries on that pay-per-view and the other one when it comes through. And of course, if you want to hear when the next wrestling related videos come out, which will be in November for a review of Survivor Series and the Friday flashback of the Royal Rumble 2004 pay-per-view for that series, all you have to do is click the subscribe button there so you do not miss a thing. And as a result, I've now got to get out of here. I've got a lot more video stuff to get done because the next month for me is going to be utterly, utterly hectic. And if you like poems or human ones, you're going to enjoy that. If not so, I will look forward to your acquaintance when the next wrestling video comes out. So stay tuned to the Twitter at CC Network YT if you do not want to miss when that ends up being. And as a result, I must bid you all adieu. I have been Freddie Thomas. You've been people listening. This has been the No Mercy 2017 review for the CC Network. And I will see you all next time.